I speak a lot, as Jim mentioned, about the economy, the markets, and uh, and it's really good to see a lot of faces around here that I, I suspect you're here voluntarily, and that um, that actually you might have some interest in what's happening on an economic front, and particularly on the markets. Um, I'm going to split my comments up in, in, in two different sections. Um, one. Uh, about the economy, what's happening there, but more, but of equal importance, if not more importance, on um, how that translates to the uh, investment markets. And you know, we hear a lot about what's happening in the economy, but how do we make investment decisions around um, the different variables and factors that are happening economically in the world? So um, hopefully, we can we can talk a little bit about that, and, and when we get the questions and answers, we can get a little deeper into those types of things. Um, so let me, um, let me just make some key points here as we get started. Um, economic growth, specifically in the U.S., has re remained choppy. Um, you know, I've classified the economy as both resilient and frustrating um, in that we continue to make a little bit of ground and then we give it back. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about how and why that's happening. Um, there still remain some challenges. I think my colleagues are going to hit on a couple of those. Um, the secular debt issue in the U.S. Uh, continues to be a struggle. Uh, the fiscal deficit and some of the things happening in Washington continue to be headwinds for both the economy and, uh, and the related markets. Um, I'll keep some high level, make some high-level comments about that. Uh, major indicators, however, are seeing improvement. And, um, and we've seen some improvement over the last couple of years. So we'll, we'll hit on a couple key points there that we use specifically as we make our investment decisions. And then finally, the markets will likely remain volatile over the next couple of years. But we at Fulton Financial Advisors believe they'll, they'll, while they'll remain volatile, uh, they'll continue in a positive direction. And I think we have some pretty strong evidence of why that will be. So let's, let's touch on the economy real quickly and, uh, and take a, a, a broad look of what we've experienced over the last 10, 12 years or so. Um, you can see uh, the U.S. economy uh, over the last uh, year or so has increased by about 2.2%. And in fact, the last few years, uh, dating back to 2009, where you can see the bars uh, in the negative uh, portion of the graph, have um, uh, been about 2% or so. And um, if you can see that red line, um, that's what our forecast is, quite frankly, for the next uh, two years, 2013, 2014. A little bit, or about two, two and a quarter percent um, uh, rising thereafter. And that's why I've defined the economy as, as frustrating in that we still, we can't seem to get above this 2% level. That historically hasn't been the case. You can look back in the 2001, 2002, in the, um, in the, 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 the real estate uh, uh, strength during the 2004 through 2008, you can see a pretty strong and robust co economy. Um, we just can't seem to break the gap over uh, 2%. But you know, I, I've also said that it's resilient in that when you think about what we've been through since 2009, uh, the fact that we've had any growth at all, when you look at what's happened in uh, the world, both our uh, credit crisis, the European credit crisis, the fiscal cliff that we were hearing about last year, sequestering that we're hearing about in the blunt, uh, the blunt um, spending cuts that we're into in the first quarter of this year, it's really surprising that we've managed any growth at all. So the economy fundamentally has a strong base. It's just trying to get rid of some of these uh, headwinds that have prevented it to get above this red line. I have the um, fourth quarter number there. It was actually the first quarter in 13 that we've experienced negative growth. It was negative 0.1%. Um, had a lot to do with defense spending and inventories leading into the fourth quarter last year and, um, and the fiscal cliff. So what does that mean? Well, basically what we're seeing out there, when you look at both business and private spending, we're seeing some improvement. Okay, you take a look at everything from cars and light vehicle sales, you can see we're up about the average historically. Housing starts is beginning to recover. The housing market is starting to see a little bit of light. We're seeing some recovery there. That, those are indicators on personal spending. How is the, the everyday average American consumer um, going out and spending their dollars? If we see things like vehicles and housing improve, it's a pretty good sign that 
Americans are out shopping. They're spending money. That should translate to higher economic growth over time. Um, similarly, inventories and capital goods orders tend to measure what businesses are doing out in the economy. And as you can see, we've had some robust um, growth in inventories since the uh, recession of 2009. And capital orders have even come back. Big orders, uh, business orders, things that go into the production of, of capital goods has come back to nearly the average. We see that as positive signs that the economy's on the meds. There's a little bit of strength built into uh, what we're seeing in both the personal and business spending standpoint. Um, one of the things we tend to look at when we, look, when we, we see those tend to be what um, you would call, um, those are indicators, those are measures from the past, right? If we're looking to forecast what the future will look like, we would rather look at what are good factors, what are good variables to help us give an idea of what we could expect going forward. We use a leading indicating uh, measure, and as you can see, it's been uh, pretty strong since 2009. Since about 2011, it's been pretty erratic. There's no real trend, there's no real consistency in the leading indicators, um, which makes forecasting very difficult. But if you think back what happened at that point in time, this is really right about mid-2011 when Washington got involved. When we started hearing about the debt ceiling and all of the issues around how are we going to raise our debt. We started hearing about fiscal cliff. This was to us as the best indicator, not only that the, the economy is choppy, right? You can see that in, in, in the statistics, but also Washington's having a big influence on, on where the economy's headed. So um, I know we're gonna talk about that a little further, so I'll leave that uh, for the moment. Um, we are in a deleveraging environment. Deleveraging is a painful, painful thing to experience. And you can see on the right-hand side, we ran up in, in the third quarter of 2011. Um, for, our debt was, by individual, was 14% of our disposable income, probably one of the highest levels in record. You know, I always talk about when you see, these side, you see some of these slides in hindsight, you can say, well, no wonder we had a credit crisis, right? We were over leveraged, we, we borrowed too much, we couldn't afford it. Well, the good news is, and a, another positive signal is, it's come down pretty dramatically. Thanks to interest rates um, declining, on everything from mortgages to credit cards to people spending a little less. We're beginning to get our debt circumstances in, 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 in check, um, though it's a painful process and it's a long process. Um, it impacts employment. Uh, if we're not spending, there's less jobs out there. The good news is, is we've um, we lost 8.9 million jobs through the recession. We've gained about 5.1 million jobs since the recovery. That brings us to about to an unemployment rate of, of 7.8% as the last measurement. Um, this is probably a two to two, two to three year phenomena that we will um, look to work down jobs slowly as in a 2% economic environment, the pace of job growth will probably be about a half percent a year or so in a decline. So if we're growing at 2% a year, we probably have about a half percent decline. So, we, so you know, I would say about 6%, which is, is more of a, a realistic average into a, to 2015. Um, I think we're gonna talk a little bit uh, more about the debt. Um, I mentioned once Washington started to get involved, uh, the economies certainly started to behave more erratically. Um, we have a debt issue in this country. Um, we're, uh, I, I can't even say we're specifically working on it, though there's a lot of conversation about it. Um, uh, these two charts just re reference what the forecast is for debt on different <coughs> scenarios uh, going forward. When we, uh, when we corrected or adjusted the revenue side of the equation uh, on um, December 31st of last year, we shifted our debt structure to the point that we leveled it off which basically is that uh, yellow line. Um, the original, if, if everything happened with the fiscal cliff, that was representative of the gray line, which actually would have declined our, um, our uh, net debt um, relative to GDP. We're at about a, uh, a flat line at this point. The sequestering uh, that's being talked about now that takes place March 1st, 
um, is meant to bring that down, though it has a, uh, an income or an impact to jobs that, um, I, that most people believe is unintended. The challenge around this debt um, issue, quite frankly, is that um, most of the programs that, that chew up the majority of the revenues in the country are things that people hold near and dear to their heart, Social Security, Defense, Medicare, um, um, those types of things. Those are tough programs to, uh, to uh, attach uh, a uh, budget cut number two. So um, we're, it's a difficult situation to, uh, to be involved in. Fact is, is that, and I'll, I'll leave it with this from an indicator standpoint, sentiment is improving. Now with all of those other statistics that uh, we look at fundamentally, the one thing that we know very clearly is when people are feeling good, they spend more money. And when people are feeling bad, they spend less. So the University of Mich Michigan does a uh, consumer sentiment measure uh, monthly to, 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 to measure how we're feeling about the economy and how we're feeling about our job and so forth. And, um, and that is a direct relation to, to how we go out and spend. It's a good forecasting tool. And the blue line shows that we're actually back feeling about the same we did in 2007, which we think is a pretty good indicator of where we're headed. We think that momentum-wise, the economy is on the upswing. Um, and, and provided that uh, those measures stay above or at where we were in 2007, we should see the red line, which is the spending line, uh, increase. Now why that in, is important is two-thirds of the economy is made up of consumer spending. So if consumers are spending more, we're bound to see the economy increase. Inflation remains low, um, uh, which uh, depending on your perspective actually is a, is a good thing. Um, and uh, it makes our investment theses um, uh, 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 difficult to predict when inf inflation is high. So a muted, low inflationary environment is good. Though, um, what, uh, what from a forecast perspective is with all of the money coming in the system, the, the, you know, we've been in a, uh, a global easing environment. That has a, an outcome of increasing inflation. More money in the system, more dollars chasing goods, we're bound to see inflation rise. So we believe while we've seen moderate to low inflation over the last few years, the trend is more upward sloping than certainly downward sloping. And we'll talk a little bit about why that's important in a minute. Um, similarly with interest rates. Interest rates have come down dramatically, uh, particularly through the, uh, the, the credit crisis, but they've been on a long-term secular trend downward. Um, we don't see that, or we see that continuing going forward. Uh, Fed Chairman Bernanke was, was in Washington yesterday talking about his efforts in the U.S. on, on quantitative easing. And, and he very clearly said, we will continue until we hit our mandates of, of both inflation and employment. So while we don't necessarily believe interest rates are going to decline any further, um, we don't see them rising at least in the next uh, year or so. So how do we invest in, a, in an environment like that, particularly when we have low inflation uh, and low interest rates? We've done a lot of studies on, on what different scenarios relative to inflation and interest rates, what asset classes perform well in those environments, and what asset classes do not. Um, we are, as mentioned, in a low but potentially rising in inflation environment. And that's in the bottom, that box represents, represented in the bottom left hand corner. It would suggest that equities and commodities tend to be the most, the most best performing asset classes in those environments relative to bonds and cash. And that's what we've adopted at, as Fulton as a, uh, as a guideline in terms of how we're allocating portfolios currently. So the question is, is okay, well, if equities look pretty attractive on a, uh, on a near-term basis, um, how about on the short term? Well, if, if you've been following along, we've had a, an amazing run just in, the last, uh, just in the last 45 days in the equity markets, probably up about 6 six and a half percent um, since the beginning of the year off of a 16% return in the S&P 500 last year. Very strong. In fact, if you go back to the, to the market low of uh, 2009, we're up over 100% in the equity market. So people start to wonder when we get to these high levels, these peaks, at least at around 1,500 on the S&P, 
Are we bound for a correction? Are we bound for a crash? You know, that number seems to be the boogeyman in terms of uh, being able to breach and, and surpass that number. When we, when we look at it, we do some comparisons over and above just simply the absolute level of 1,500 and look at the statistics behind it. And some of those are listed here for you, but particularly the price earning ratio, the valuation of the market is much different than it was in the two prior peaks in 2000 and 2007. Um, the dividend yield is much higher, which means companies' balance sheets are much stronger. And, uh, and the, the competitive investment um, and built into the risk premium of the equity market, that is the 10-year treasury yield, is much lower than it ever was back in 2000, 2007. Lead us to believe that may, we may be in for a near-term correction, near-term reduction in uh, the S&P 500 just simply because of the uh, quickness and expansion of the market in the last 12 months, um, maybe to the tune by 10%. That's not unusual, um, but long-term, we think we have a better valuation on the market than we have in the past. And certainly compared to um, bonds, uh, the earnings yield on the S&P versus um, bonds today uh, has a, is, is at a spread that we haven't seen in quite some time. Corporate balance sheets are much stronger. You can see total leverage uh, in, in corporations is much less than it ever was, uh, financing and interest coverage. Um, one couple last things on, on equities is the earnings per share of the S&P 500, we're seeing record earnings uh, over the last couple years. Um, there's been a huge, uh, a huge increase since 2008, 2009 of what companies in the U.S. are, uh, are generating in terms of earnings. It may be a little bit harder in the next year or so. A lot of that came out of the margin portion of the revenue stream because of such great cuts in, in uh, employment. So you can kind of see how these things over on the right, on the, on the bar chart on the right hand side, that these earnings estimates are starting to uh, max out and peak. A lot of people think that potentially has some risk to stocks, though we still on an absolute basis and on an evaluation basis think we're, we're okay. Fact is, and I, I mentioned this up front, that um, it's not unusual for the market to have a five, ten percent retreat during inner year during the year. In fact, last year I mentioned the market was up about sixteen percent. We had two periods during the year just last year alone, and one of the strongest markets we've had in the last five, that the market was down close to ten and and uh, almost eight just during the year. A lot of people ask, well, what should I do if the market's starting to soften? You know, what should I do if the market's up 6% and it retreats, you know, 6 7% here in a short period of time? Well, the fact is, is that um, staying invested in those short periods is probably the best idea no matter what. And you can see the red line. If you just remained invested during those periods of, of, of volatility, you still returned, um, and this was through the remainder of the year, 13.7%. Uh, so it's not to say that you don't want to make good investment decisions based on all of the economic factors that we talked about. The other thing is you don't want to lose your head when you're talking about the equity markets. And even though there's some times where there, it's volatile than others, um, you can still make some pretty good money out of it. So in summary, um, we're seeing economic growth pick up to a walk. Major indicators um, like uh, the leading indicators, uh, business and uh, consumer spending is, is Improving. Debt remains a challenge. I think we're going to talk about that in some detail. And, um, and there's a strong case as a result of the volatility, particularly in the equity and fixed income markets, for making good quality decisions around uh, how you invest in those markets and then letting, letting the markets behave the way they behave um, and making sure that you're participating.